What is going on guys? Well, it has been a while since I have done a tier list ranking and I started to get the itch. So I figured how cool and fun might it be to rank all of the significant horror icons, a bunch of slasher villains that we all know, love, and some of which we hate. And uh, yeah, that sounded like a fun idea to me. So let's check this out. I've got six tiers going here and from worst to best, we have the rejects, we have the slash and a miss, Memorable Enough, Bloody Good, Killer, and the Coveted Iconic. In the video description below, I am going to be including a link to this tier list so that you guys can do your own. Please tag me on Instagram or Twitter, X, uh, whatever social media you guys want to share it on to let me know that you've done it so I can see your list. If you guys end up doing a video on YouTube, please tag me on that as well. And let's try to have some fun with this one. And one of the key ways to do that is to keep in mind that this is just my opinion. These are my preferences. These are the horror icons that I love, kind of like, and don't like whatsoever. I'm going to try to be subjective while also being objective at the same time, if that's even possible. Some of these I'm going to keep in account the fact that they are iconic, the fact that they do have a legacy, but I'm not going to mince words if their movies or the executions of these characters are terrible. But really quick before we dive into this tier list ranking, if you're like me and spend a lot of time doing lists like these and making videos like these and you don't have so much time anymore to be cooking fresh awesome meals for yourself or your family then check out the sponsor of today's video hello fresh well as the summer comes to a close and fall right around the corner us parents tend to get wore down with readjusting back to school schedules buying supplies taking kids to practices the list just goes on and on well this year you can make the back to school transition easier than ever by letting hello fresh pick up the groceries and deliver pre-portioned meals right to your doorstep hello fresh keeps your taste buds on their toes with 40 chef crafted recipes to select from every week from family friendly to fit and wholesome there is always something new to try. Simply choose your recipes and pick your delivery date. Then sit back and enjoy the last few days of summer knowing that dinner has been taken care of. And HelloFresh makes cooking dinner so easy that in less than 30 minutes, my wife and I made two separate meals. Chicken sausage cavatappi bolognese and fajita pork lettuce wraps. The pre-portioned ingredients not only make the cooking process faster, but there's hardly any cleanup. And the instruction sheets are organized and simplified to where my wife, who is usually very intimidated in the kitchen can cook a great meal with no stress. So if you want to take the guesswork out of cooking and make your weeknights so much easier, go to HelloFresh.com or visit the link in the description box below and use code 50 Cody Leach at checkout for 50% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com and use the code 50 Cody Leach at checkout for 50% off plus free shipping. And thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video. Now with all that being said, guys, let's go ahead and crack this thing open and start off with the first person on the docket today and that is Angela from the Sleepaway Camp franchise. She is the lead villain in basically all four movies. One of them, well two of them is kind of the secret, the other two not so much and we have had two different actresses portray this character. So if you guys want to check out my Sleepaway Camp reviews I'll put a link up here but I'm going to stick Angela under bloody good. I think she's a really good slasher villain, especially in the original Sleepaway Camp. And I really enjoy Pamela Springsteen's version as well in two and three. In the fourth film, the character might as well be non-existent. And uh, really just the quality of the Sleepaway Camp franchise, I think, holds this character back a little bit. This is one of those horror icons and classic slasher movies that I actually think would benefit greatly from a modern remake, barring the fact that they do not sanitize it, that they do not make it a, a very <laughs> modern day watered down version of that movie, which is next to impossible. So it's probably never going to happen. But Angela, very good character, very creepy, very well done by Felissa Rose and Pamela Springsteen. And she goes in bloody good. Coming up next is going to be that lovely doll, Annabelle. And I'm not even going to waste any time. Annabelle goes right into the rejects for me. I have never understood the massive appeal of this character. Memorable enough sequence in the first Conjuring, but I never really thought it was this big standout thing that a lot of people seem to have, have found it to be when they saw that original film. And it's certainly not enough meat on the bones of this character to have three standalone films. 
The first Annabelle movie is quite often hailed as the worst of the Conjuring franchise. I actually quite like Annabelle creation, but it's not because of Annabelle. <laughs> and really the movies, the, the two good ones are barely about Annabelle as it is. It's about the things that like Annabelle draws in. So I, I think this character is pretty lame and I would be heavily annoyed if they announced a fourth Annabelle film. Jeepers, creepers, where are we putting this creeper? All right, we got Jonathan Brex, the creeper. Oh yeah, and that other guy that portrayed him in Jeepers Creepers Reborn. Oh, this is going to hurt my heart, but I'm going to put the creeper in bloody good. If it was a one and done, if Jeepers Creepers was the only movie that ever came out, that would be an iconic villain for me. Uh, even with the existence of Jeepers Creepers 2, I would probably still be teetering on iconic, maybe even killer. But Jeepers Creepers 3 was horrendous. And if that wasn't bad enough, if we thought that was the floor... Jeepers Creepers Reborn was easily one of the biggest piece of shit movies I have ever seen in my life. No! And not only the movie, but the portrayal of the Creeper, the look of the Creeper was just god awful. And so unfortunately, the legacy of this franchise, as if it wasn't tainted bad enough already by Victor Salva, is pretty much in like sub zero right now. Uh, I, I would be shocked if they came out with a fifth film. And if they did, I would be extremely, extremely skeptical of how good it's going to be. So unfortunately, the awesome creature design of the creeper is going to land in bloody good. Next up, we have the nun and uh, Valak. Uh, I'm going to put it in slash and a miss because I actually think The Nun is arguably the worst film that we have gotten in the Conjuring franchise. We have The Nun 2 coming out in like a month or two, and I am not excited about it at all. I think the trailer looks extremely generic. It looks just like the first Nun, just a bunch of scares, a bunch of jump scares, and, and that's about it. So the only thing that saves Valak the Nun from being a reject is that I think it's genuinely a creepy entity. I think that it's used really well in The Conjuring 2, and despite the fact that I don't like the movie The Nun, it's still a creepy image. It's still something that I could see giving people nightmares and and being a Halloween costume that would make people a little nervous passing on the street. So I'm going to give Valak a little bit of a break and uh, we'll see. Maybe The Nun 2 will surprise me and we can bump it up to memorable enough. But for now, you just made it. Ooh, we got Pennywise. All right. So we got two different interpretations of this character. You got Tim Curry, you got Bill Skarsgård, both beloved by two very different generations. And uh, I'm going to stick Pennywise in Killer. And I almost stuck him in Bloody Good because the second half of the 1990 miniseries and It Chapter 2, I both think are pretty terrible and they do the character an extreme disservice. Shockingly enough, I think It Chapter 2 actually does even more of a disservice to the character than the 1990 miniseries. Let's do the CGI spider again, only we'll have the CGI clown face on there because that makes a difference, right? And then we can just end it with him being a little whiny bitch puddle. Oh my God, that movie. But... I've said this before, there are only two movie characters in all of movie history that have ever followed me into my nightmares. One of them is Zelda from Pet Cemetery, which is not on this list because I don't feel like she's iconic enough, only in that one movie. Uh, and then you have Pennywise, the original Tim Curry Pennywise, which some people nowadays laugh at, but back in the 90s when I was a little kid, that shit was terrifying. And so I genuinely think that Pennywise at his best is among one of the most effective and iconic horror movie characters of all time. It's just a shame that twice now, and even in the book to some degree, they cannot figure out a way to stick the landing with this character. Otherwise, that would be a shoe-in for iconic. Now, we're taking a wrong turn, and we're going to have the Hillbilly family from the Wrong Turn franchise, and you fuckers are going right into rejects. The Wrong Turn franchise is, to this date, the worst movie franchise that I have covered in a review series. I like the first movie good enough. It's a solid three star riff on Texas Chainsaw type movies. And I think that the uh, remake is actually pretty damn good as well. To hell with all you woke turn people. But with the exception of those two movies, all of the sequels of the original wrong turn movie are all pretty god awful. The origin one is tolerable enough, but the other ones just get progressively worse and mean spirited and gross. And oh, these characters are terrible. They're not really memorable or iconic enough to even have me remember their name. 
There's nothing really stand out about the look of them or a signature kill or signature weapons or anything. There's just not much of anything that I appreciate about these characters outside of that first movie that utilizes them pretty well. So without a doubt, they are going in the rejects. Agnes, it's me, Billy. We've got Billy from Black Christmas. And of course, you have the Black Christmas. Was it 2004, 2006 remake, which is a a totally different interpretation of the character. We have the fan film It's Me, Billy by my buddy Dave McRae that continues the original and coming soon. It's Me, Billy, Chapter Two, which I hope is going to be awesome. So Billy, for me, I'm going to put in memorable enough. And the only reason why he is there is because he is one of those very minimalist villains that it's not necessarily Billy that stands out about the original black Christmas, which I genuinely think is one of the greatest horror movies of all time. One of the most underappreciated slasher films of all time. Uh, the phone calls, the sound design, the atmosphere, the tension, it's all of the, the technical filmmaking and the, the building of dread that is in that original Black Christmas that makes it iconic. While Billy is certainly an interesting enough character to build upon, and I'm curious to see what Dave and uh, Bruce are going to do and kind of bring in that home with It's Me, Billy, too. But if we're only going to count the actual movie releases that go into theaters, you have one outstanding version of Billy where he is very minimalist in the movie. You have one very balls out, wacky, weird version in the uh, Black Xmas remake. And then I don't even think the character is even referenced in the 2019 piece of shit. So, uh, yeah, this is not a reflection on the original Black Christmas movie. Absolutely check that out. But I'm sticking Billy and memorable enough. Helen, be my victim. We have Candyman. And Candyman for me is going right up into killer. And that is a testament to how incredible the original Candyman movie is. And despite being very heavy handed, how good I genuinely think the modern reboot was from a year or two ago. The two movies in the middle, the Day of the Dead and and Farewell to the Flesh are pretty trash. I mean, that they're bad enough to where I almost feel like it's justified putting Candyman in bloody good. But as far as the iconic nature of of a signature villain. You don't get much better than Candyman. I mean, he's got an iconic look. He has a lore to him that is really tragic and dark and fucked up. He's got the signature weapon of the hook that is put into his severed hand. His voice with Tony Todd is absolutely iconic. You get the bees. I mean, there is so much about Candyman that is just such a rich character that even if you have never seen the Candyman movies, you know who Candyman is and you know all those different aspects to the character because he penetrated pop culture so heavily in the 90s where aside from Ghostface, no other horror characters penetrated pop culture. So Candyman, showing my respect, throwing him in killer. Boy, we have Tall Man. Oh man, this is the one that I think people are going to get debated on the most, but I am throwing Tall man, straight up into iconic. And again, this is a love or hate franchise and by attachment, a love or hate character. But Phantasm 1 and Phantasm 2 are among my favorite horror films, favorite movies of all time. And even though the third film is extremely campy and silly, the fourth film, while I think is very creative, is it doesn't work very well as a standalone movie as much as it does as like a companion piece for established fans. And Phantasm Ravager is an absolute garbage final film for this franchise. That still is not enough for me not to consider the tall man iconic for all of the pretty much same reasons that I put Candyman and killer. But tall man has just had much more of an impact on me in my life where you have this very iconic presence of a character and performance by Angus Scrim, the voice, the one liners like boy or you think when you die, you go to heaven. You come to us. All of those things that just stand out so much about the character, the so the spheres, the dwarfs. I mean, the the way that he interacts with these characters throughout this franchise and just comes in and out of those dimension forks and you never quite get a read on what, who or why the hell this character is. 
all of those things are why I personally love the tall man. But I understand if all those reasons are why you do not like the tall man <laughs> or the Phantasm movies whatsoever. Another film that I genuinely think could benefit greatly from a modern remake from somebody who loves the original and can do something really cool and unique with it and maybe ground it a bit more. <laughs> maybe don't have it be quite as cerebral and weird and, and nondescript. But nonetheless, I adore the tall man and... He is my first entry in the iconic tier. And now we have Hannibal Lecter. And we have had three different, no, four different interpretations of this character. Uh, we had Brian Cox in Manhunter, of course, the most iconic being Anthony Hopkins. And then we also had Mads Mikkelsen, which I actually think arguably might be the best version of the character. I get a little bit of flack for saying that, but he is awesome as Hannibal and then uh, I forget the guy's name. He just passed away not too long ago, but the one who played the origin version of him in Hannibal Rising, uh, based off of a series of novels as well, if you didn't know that. Most people do. But I'm sticking Hannibal up there in Killer, uh, one of the most interesting villains of all time because he's always kind of a companion piece in the movies. He's never quite the focus. He's never quite the star. And yet he always leaves the biggest impact. You think about The Silence of the Lambs. I think Anthony Hopkins has like 10 minutes of screen time in that movie, and yet he is the most memorable and iconic part of that bar none. And so there's many different interpretations of this character. All of them, with the exception of Hannibal Rising, in my opinion, are all pretty unique and impactful in their own ways. Hannibal, the series, one of the best TV series ever. And please, TV gods, Netflix gods, whoever the hell has the money, buy this shit and give us a season four based off of the Silence of the Lambs. I know there's rights issues, but battle through that shit. Stranger things have happened. Let us have it. Hannibal, awesome. Going and killer. My boy, Freddy Krueger. Look, I mean, is it going to be any surprise whatsoever that Freddy is going straight up to iconic? Look, objectively, doesn't have the strongest slate of movies. I can agree with that. I can appreciate that truth, even as a massive Nightmare on Elm Street fan. Uh, about half of the franchise, I could completely leave, never watch again, and I would be fine. But Freddy Krueger, much like the other character I have in Iconic and a few of the ones that I have in Killer, has made some of the biggest impact in horror and in pop culture of all time and will probably go down by the end of life as we know it as one of the most iconic movie characters of all time. The performance by Robert Englund is synonymous with the character. Whether you're talking about the dark, scary Freddy or the more comedic, campy Freddy, which I'm not as much of a fan of, but it has its appeal. Uh, I think that the themes of nightmares and fear and penetrating into somebody's psyche, it, he is one of, if not the best horror villains that have captured that on screen. You have a character that is very dark and creepy and has unlimited power and has a bit of a device there where you can't escape him. There's no running away from Freddy. You can't move. You can't change your name. You can't dye your hair and move out of state. None of that. As long as you eventually fall asleep, which everybody eventually will, especially the more you struggle, you're going to fall victim to him. And that is terrifying. And then you also have some of the best iconic one-liners of all time. Some of them get pretty silly <laughs> as the franchise goes on, but still, you have a character that is equally known as being one of the most terrifying villains of all time and one of the most entertaining and campy one-liner-fueled characters of all time, and there's not many I can say that for, except for my other favorite. Now we have Damien from the Omen series, and I'm going to stick Damien in memorable enough. I adore the original Omen from the 70s. That is probably my favorite horror film from the 70s, and there's some heavy hitters in that era. I think that he is a really creepy concept, especially as a parent. When you think of the ultimate evil and something that is literally going to bring humanity to its knees and end life as we know it. And it's in the face of the child that you love and have raised for years. That is possibly the most terrifying concept up on this board right now, because what do you do at that point? And how do you bring yourself to believe that enough to, to take that, to strike that person down that, that enough right there is enough to stick them up in the top three tiers I, I still think Damien Omen 2 is a pretty entertaining movie. It's a little bit more of a Final Destination take on the character to where he's a little more in the know of what's going on and a lot more of an evil little shit versus a cute little kid that just has a really dark upbringing. 
Uh, not a fan of Sam Neill's version whatsoever, as much as I love Sam Neill. And the remake, eh, not a fan of that one either. Uh, so that's what really holds back Damien from getting up at least into bloody good is just the quality of his films as they have gone on. But the original Omen especially, absolute icon. Now we have Ghostface, and this is a tricky one because Scream and the image of Ghostface, the costume, undoubtedly is iconic. There is no debate on that whatsoever. However, Ghostface is the only character up here, I believe, that is multiple characters, multiple identities, different people, different motivations, different personalities, different quality of executions. And so that holds the character back a bit for me. When you say ghost face, it's like, well, which one are you talking about? One of the good ones like Billy and Stu or one of the shitty ones. And for me, that is going to stick ghost face in bloody good because Again, Scream, that franchise, at, at this point especially, after the Chucky franchise has, has had a few <laughs> slips here and there, I think is, along with Evil Dead, arguably the most consistent quality as far as horror franchise goes. And I really enjoy all of the movies to some extent. I don't think it was a bad movie in the bunch, but there is definitely some bad ghost face. And there is some sillier interpretations of the character. There is some very disappointing unmaskings and very predictable unmaskings. I think that there are more mediocre to unmemorable reveals of Ghostface than there are awesome and iconic ones. So going to scale him back just a tad, even though I love him and he's going in bloody good. See, I did both. I appealed to everybody, the hardcore fans and the, the posters. <laughs> Jason Voorhees, baby. Mama's boy himself. We're going to stick him in killer. We'll just go ahead and rip the bandaid off now. He's not iconic enough. For me personally, he is an icon of horror. He is on the Mount Rushmore of horror villains, but of the major ones that most people acknowledge and talk about, he's probably my least favorite just because of the execution of the character and the movies has been pretty spotty and inconsistent for my taste. And I'm not somebody who grew up with the Friday the 13th movies. I was not, I have no nostalgia for any of those movies. I was not an established fan. I watched them much later in life. And because of that, I don't necessarily have the love for them that some people do, CP. But you have the Ted White version of Jason. You have the Richard Brooker version of Jason. You have the Derek Mears version of Jason that I think all three of those are absolute top tier versions. I'm not as big of a fan of the Kane Hodder era, especially the movies. And from there, it just kind of gets bad after you get out of Kane Hodder territory. And really, it's more so about the movies like Jason's cool. The hockey mask is iconic. He's got a ton of kills. He's got some really creative kills, but he's never been a character that has scared me or intimidated me aside from Derek Mears that I wouldn't want that guy chasing me. Uh, and that's really what holds it back to killer for me. Like for iconic, it's somebody that has meant a lot to me personally. And Jason just hasn't quite gotten there for all, as awesome as he is. And as much as I love certain aspects of him. So CP for this alone, I'm sure he's going to do a rebuttal video or a reaction video or a three hour live stream or, or something. So stay tuned for that. And now we have Jigsaw. How do you do fellow kids? Jigsaw for me, I'm going to put in memorable enough. Like this is one of those uh, kind of, we're going to get into this again with like pinhead to where he is the iconic villain of a franchise, but he's barely present. He's not really the focus ever, even in the movies where he is one of the main figureheads going on and he's actually alive in, <laughs> which is less than half of this franchise. Oddly enough, he's never really much of a focus. He's never really a, a big presence. What's interesting about Jigsaw is his, while flawed completely, his kind of complex that he's not actually a killer and he hasn't done anything wrong and he's not at fault for anything that has gone on because these victims make the choices. And I think he's absolutely full of shit. I think he's an absolute psychopath, but uh, there is at least an interesting thing there where he's the only villain on this list that doesn't consider himself a villain or a killer whatsoever. Tobin Bell, iconic performance for sure for the little bit that we see of him to the point where that's the only option they have left to reboot this thing now with Saw X is, well, just put Tobin Bell back in it and make it a fucking prequel to the second movie or whatever. Just do that. Put him back in it. 
Uh, and he's got a cool look. He does with the, with the robe, and especially when you have the Billy puppet and everything with him. Like he's got some some cool style to him. So memorable enough. Basically, the definition of memorable enough. Now we have Leatherface, and I don't know if this is gonna be a hot take or not, but Leatherface is only getting up to bloody good for me, and I actually think I'm being generous by doing that. Now you have the original version of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and you have the remake as well as Texas Chainsaw Massacre the beginning that I think are the best versions of these characters the best on-screen performances the best look of these characters the best utilization of what is creepy and unsettling about these character this character but Every other interpretation of Leatherface for me is either okay or god awful. I mean, even though I love Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2, that is an absolute cartoon version of Leatherface. Leatherface from, well, Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, not memorable at all. One of the worst looks of the character in my mind. Do we need to even acknowledge the next generation and what the fuck that was? And even the later movies, when you get into Texas Chainsaw 3D, that was an absolute miss. And the remake, or not the remake, excuse me, the, the Netflix reboot, the legacy sequel, third attempt. <laughs> that, uh, I mean, I, I like the fact that he's a hulking, gigantic, brooding figure that is just massive. But again, not, not really a memorable take on the character. So while I think Leatherface at his best is iconic, at his worst, he's an embarrassment. At his worst, he's extremely off-putting. And we have gotten more versions of that than the iconic versions. And now we have the Miner from My Bloody Valentine, Harry Warden himself. Uh, we've had two versions of this movie. I don't believe there's been anything else. There's the original, and then there's the 3D remake, which I actually prefer. Uh, I don't know if that's a, a very hot take or not, but um, eh, slash and a miss. <laughs> slash and a miss for me. Uh, the character has a cool enough look to stand out from all of the other kind of more generic masked killers that we have had in slasher history, but I am not a fan of the original My Bloody Valentine whatsoever. A couple of really cool kills, but I don't like the movie. I don't necessarily like the reveal of who the minor killer is, nor the motivation or the explanation behind it. And while My Bloody Valentine 3D is a lot of fun that I do prefer, it's still a pretty big schlock fest. Uh, and, 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 you know, Jensen Ackles, I love you. <laughs> you're almost enough for me to put it in memorable enough just because you're there. But, uh, yeah, the minor character, I, I almost forgot to even include that character when I was gathering these characters for this list, if that says anything. So, slash and a miss with that. Big ass pickaxe. I want me gold. A friend with weed is a friend indeed, but a friend with gold is the best I'm told. We have the leprechaun. Ah, uh, this one's tough. This one's tough. I'm going to put the leprechaun in memorable enough, and I, I think I'm being pretty generous with that as well. I almost feel more comfortable putting Slash in a miss, but I can't help but love Warwick Davis. I can't help but love the things that he brings to that character. Now, the version that we got in Leprechaun Origins, that's not even worth acknowledging. That was like a fucking Wendigo or something. I don't know what that was. The guy that took over for Leprechaun Origins, uh, or not Leprechaun Origins, the, 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 the one after that, Leprechaun Returns, did a pretty good job at, at kind of mimicking the Warwick Davis Leprechaun, I gotta be honest. But it's just the quality of the movies that hold this character back significantly. And they're all pretty rough. That, that That's in the running for worst franchise that I have reviewed. But Wrong Turn absolutely takes that, uh, that shit-colored trophy. So I used to love these movies when I was a kid. I used to rent them constantly from family video. I would just kind of cycle through them. I loved the original for the long time. I thought 3 was probably the best for the longest time. And, you know, as an adult, I got a good bit of fun from Leprechaun Returns. I thought that was actually a pretty solid little legacy sequel that nobody asked for. So because of some nostalgia, because of some of the massive amount of joy that this character brought to me as a kid, and because I, even as an adult, I can still watch and appreciate those three that I named, one, three, and uh, Returns, he, he's fun enough for me to stick there in the middle and, and feel somewhat confident about it. Oh, Mikey. Oh, Mikey. No matter where I put this motherfucker, I'm going to get heat. Oh, look, I just got to pull off the Band-Aid. I'm just kidding. Michael Myers is iconic. Come on now. Did you really think? Did you really think I was going to pull that shit? Nigga, you good. You almost got me, you motherfucker. Michael Myers. 
despite the fact that some of his followers can absolutely eat a dick in my mind, uh, Michael Myers is one of those characters that has given a gigantic kick in the ass to the slasher genre at least twice at this point. The original film by John Carpenter, albeit a little overrated in my mind, is honestly one of the best horror films ever made, one of the most iconic ones, one of the most important ones for sure. Even though it steals a little thunder from the original Black Christmas, it was a very, very important monumental film that kicked off the 80s slasher genre, uh, as well as kind of reignited it here in the 2020s with uh, Halloween 2018. So iconic look, one of the most simplistic looks, but when done well, (laughs) less than half of the time in the franchise. It is one of the most iconic looks. And here recently, Mikey actually passed Jason Voorhees as having the most kills for any slasher villain. And there's also a lot of creativity in his kills for the most part. And when they execute the character to his best, like in the first two Halloweens, uh, to a degree in Halloween 4, despite that god-awful mask, and... uh, not really talking about the quality of that trilogy, but for the most part in the the new Halloween reboot trilogy, he's a very intimidating, creepy, and powerful horror villain. And, you know, there's a reason why I think it's safe to say that most slasher fans out there have Michael Myers as their top dog, as their number one. And while he's not mine, I understand that. So Michael Myers, gotta love him. Can't blame him for his crazy following. He's going up an iconic. My boy, my baby boy, we got Chucky and look, iconic. If you guys have followed me for any determined amount of time, like you know that I love Freddy and I love Chucky. Those are my top two. I got a Chucky doll right there for Christ's sake. Can you even see it? Is he obscured? He's probably obscured. I got one right there. I have two different Funko Pops over here to the right of me. I adore this character. And to a degree where you ask me tomorrow and, you know, him and Freddy Krueger are basically neck at neck. And and depending on my mood, I can tell you one is better than the other. But Chucky is the reason why I am a horror fan. He was the first horror film I ever watched in Child's Play 3. He has continued to be one of my biggest sources of bloody joy (laughs) going on all the way into my 30s. And despite the fact that uh, two of his movies and one season of his TV show, I think, is pretty terrible, uh, there has been a lot more just genuinely great entries in what this character has brought. I love his personality. I love how dark and twisted and fucked up he is while being very hilarious with his one-liners, significantly better with his one-liners than Freddy, I think, as far as just averages go. Uh, and I love the look of the doll in most of the movies. The scarred look is my favorite from Bride and, and even Seed. And you have the voice acting by Brad Dorif that, with the exception of Cult of Chucky, that I felt with the writing was just a little weak, is flat out iconic every single time he steps into the recording booth. I just love this character. It's genuinely one of the most important movie characters in the world to me. And even if the next four seasons of the Chucky TV series is absolutely not for me, nothing's going to kick Chucky out of iconic. He is there to stay. And now we have Norman Bates and one of the most criminally overlooked horror icons of all time. Norman Bates is absolutely iconic. Not only is the original Psycho one of the most important horror films and slasher films of all time, but Psycho 2, which I actually prefer, that's my favorite, is one of the best horror sequels ever made. And not enough people have seen it or give it enough credit for being that. For following up an Alfred Hitchcock film 20 years later and giving it to a brand new filmmaker that isn't Alfred Hitchcock, like the writing on the wall for that to be a dog shit movie. If somebody announced something like that today, the internet would explode with a bunch of naysayers and I would be one of the loudest voices. Psycho two is incredible. Psycho three, while not nearly as good as the first two is still very entertaining. And even Psycho four, which is a made for TV movie and certainly is not the best is actually by slasher standards, a pretty decent little ending to this character and the whole four movie arc that Norman Bates goes through as a character I think is one of the best and most complete character arcs for a villain that we have ever had 
Now, we're not going to talk about Vince Vaughn. <laughs> like Vince Vaughn, that whole movie, it was an experiment. I don't even know why we continue to talk about it. It's not really worth talking about. But even if we are going to talk about it, that's not enough of a knock against the character or the franchise to, to pull him out of iconic. So if you have ever put Norman Bates under the folder of not important enough to acknowledge, or if you have been one of those people that assume that the other Psycho movies are not worth checking out, please do yourself a favor and treat yourself and at least watch Psycho 2. And if that movie doesn't sell you, fair enough. But if it does, I think you'll still enjoy Psycho 3 and Psycho 4 to a certain degree. And then you have the Bates Motel show. And again, a very different interpretation of the character, much more modern and younger, but what an outstanding performance. What a really shockingly good TV series that was. And how great of a job they did at taking the classic psycho elements and modernizing them in the way that doesn't bastardize the original. So check out that series, too, if you have not. That was absolutely a surprise. But Norman Bates, straight up there to the top, baby. Respect, bitch. Now we have Esther from the Orphan movies. And I'm going to stick Esther in Bloody Good because the two movies are both bloody good. Now, the first movie did get ruined for me a little bit. I didn't quite have that impactful holy shit moment that everybody else did, because unfortunately, the ending was spoiled for me before I saw it. But even knowing where the movie was heading and having that surprise ruined for me, it's still a pretty awesome movie, a very violent movie. And it's a lot more dark and unforgiving than you would expect a movie like that to be. And just last year, we had Orphan First Kill that was coming out. I was one of the biggest naysayers in the world. I was like, is it really going to work when you have Isabel Furman coming back and she's like in her 30s now? Is she going to be able to pull off this character effectively, even just on a physical way now that she's an adult and not a little girl anymore? Is there any story worth telling? Is this just going to be 90 minutes of that quick little origin that we were told about, about the dad that she was in love with and burned the house down? Like, that's going to suck. And shame on me, because Orphan First Kill was one of my favorite horror films of last year. Pulled a gigantic rug out from underneath the um, underneath me whenever you got about halfway into it, and they actually pull a twist reveal in that, and I was like, oh, that was awesome. And I expect I would have had that same reaction in the first film. But uh, yeah, Esther, for a little girl character, is wicked as hell. Love both of those movies, and... While I don't know if it's necessarily worth ever revisiting the character, if we get a third movie that's on par with those first two, I might have to stick her up in Iconic. She's that cool. Oh, and now we have Pearl. We have one of the newest, if not the newest, addition to this list. And I'm going to stick Pearl right up in Killer. I I'm, I'm bordering on Iconic because I love those two movies so much. Where the hell did this X trilogy come from? Did anybody see this coming? I sure as hell didn't. I walked into X expecting not to like it because I don't have the best track record with A24. Walked out that being my favorite horror film of the year. And then we got that little surprise of, oh, yeah, by the way, there's already a prequel film about the villain of this movie, Pearl. It's already shot. It's being edited. And it's coming this year. And damn, Pearl was almost as good as X. It's not quite the same type of appeal for me because I prefer the movie that X is over the movie that Pearl is. But as a one-two punch of exploring that character, they are a phenomenal one-two punch. To complete out this trilogy, if Maxine is even almost as good as Pearl, that is going to go down in history as one of the best horror trilogies of all time, bar none. But a really interesting, tortured, and twisted character with a phenomenal performance by Mia Goth in both films, especially Pearl. There's no question for me that she is an absolute killer villain. Oh, the sweet suffering of the Hellraiser franchise. Uh, Pinhead, look, memorable enough. Memorable enough. And it's not Pinhead's fault that he is this low. It is because his franchise has utilized him so sparingly and so poorly. There is no other horror icon out there that is as cool and badass and haunting looking as Pinhead that the movies have decided to completely disregard to a point where it has been baffling to where when we got this remake, the, this reboot here just last year that I saw at Fantastic Fest and they decided to actually make Pinhead and the Cenobites the main focus, the main villains. I was like, fucking finally, it really took 10 or 11 movies for somebody to have that revelation. Like, I understand the utilization of them in the first film. They're, that's not the point. The villains are supposed to be Frank and uh, Julia. But after that, what the fuck? <laughs> what are you doing? You've got him on the fucking 
poster. He's the poster child of this franchise. That is the reason we are coming to these dog shit movies. <sighs> so, yeah. Uh, Pinhead, very cool character. Great performance by Doug Bradley. Not so much the other two. What the fuck is that? One of the most badass looking villains and a very big presence. The little bit that they do utilize him, some really good lines, some memorable like one liners, some iconic lines from uh, Pinhead that a lot of us horror fans rattle off randomly. So th there's enough there to get it to memorable, memorable enough. And if they follow up this David Bruckner Hellraiser and we get one or two more movies that are as good in my mind, I was a big fan of it as that movie, then we could bump Hellraiser up a little bit with the Jamie Clayton version. But unfortunately, Doug Bradley's run just got plagued with a lot of bad movies that barely acknowledge him as a character. We'll tear your soul apart. Now we have The Strangers, and The Strangers are, again, going to be memorable enough. And it's mostly because I don't really care for the movies so much. Uh, I do get some enjoyment out of The Strangers Pray at Night. A little bit of that throwback 80s slasher vibe does get a lot more mileage uh, for me. But I don't like the first film at all. I know a lot of people love it. A lot of people think it's one of the best horror films of all time. I strongly disagree. I don't think I've ever reviewed it. I need to to kind of get my thoughts across better. But the few times that I have seen that movie, I genuinely think it's a bad movie with some really badass, creepy and iconic villains, iconic potential villains. Uh, but yeah, because that first movie is is so poor in my mind and because even the second film is pretty low hanging slasher fruit, you know, it doesn't really do anything that memorable aside from just kind of be a little bit more bare bones and just let's execute some cool kills and, and have a cool 80s aesthetic to it. Uh, there's there's not enough that I've seen from these characters to put them higher than that. Now, we do have a Rennie Harlan uh, sequel or, or a standalone movie or something coming out here within the next year or so. Rennie Harlan's got a hell of a lot of style. I love a lot of his movies. So his movie by itself might bump them up to killer for me if it's good enough. But time will tell. Oh, Art the Clown. Thank God I am doing this tier ranking after seeing Terrifier 2 or I would be getting eviscerated in the comment section. Art the Clown, for me, is going up in killer. Now, I was not the biggest fan of the first Terrifier. I think it's fine. I don't hate it. But while I thought that Art the Clown was a really creepy image and the physical performance was good and certainly the practical effects and the gore and the makeup was, was very impressive, the story, the characters, everything else about the movie, which is kind of what I go to a movie for first, was definitely an afterthought in that first film. I always call it kind of a proof of concept for Art the Clown more than an actual story or a movie. But then we had Terrifier 2 come out, and I was not expecting to like this movie at all. I wasn't dreading watching it, but when I heard that it was like almost two and a half hours long, I was like, ugh. And the only saving grace was that I was going to see it at a film festival with a bunch of rowdy horror fans at midnight. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll be able to have more fun with this one, even if it's not very good. And I was shocked at how much I genuinely liked this movie and how much of a genuine improvement I thought this was in the first film. So much more uh, story and lore in there. As, as crazy as lore seems to be for a character like this, they do some wild, wacky things in there. You have the character of Sienna as kind of this counterpoint for art that is a great counterpoint. And I thought that the physical comedy and the creepiness and the gore and the makeup effects were even more impressive in Terrifier 2. So if these were the only two Terrifier films, Art the Clown would still go in history as one of the more memorable and certainly one of the most brutal, brutal horror icons of all time. And the potential is there for Terrifier 3 and onward if they decide to make it more than a trilogy. If it's as good as Terrifier 2 or even better, and if they stick the landing with the character and some of the origins and the explanation that undoubtedly we're going to eventually get, Art the Clown might bump up to iconic for me. But as of right now, very proudly putting Art the Clown in killer. Now we have The Collector. And look, two movies or not, to me, The Collector is absolutely killer. And, you know, we had the same thing with Art the Clown, but at least we're guaranteed a Terrifier 3 where not so much with The Collection. Uh, or what is it? The Collected, excuse me. So we had The Collector and we had The Collection, uh, a fantastic one-two punch of slasher movies and the collector to me way more than jigsaw which came out around the same time in the same era of the 2000s 
deserves to be on the horror icon Mount Rushmore because the look of the character is cool and unique and simplistic, which is a very hard balance to have. I love the story and the style of both of the movies, uh, even with the counterpoint of Arkin as the protagonist. I think that strengthens the character of the collector. Uh, the the style, the modus operandi, the the signature weapons and kill style of the character, both in the first film with like the the sick and twisted traps and in the second film with like the big warehouse of pain and having the bloodhound dogs that he kicks open the door and releases on people. There, there was so much about this character, but with those two movies, that was just so stand out to me to where it, it still maddens me to this day that they're fucking around with that third film that they started shooting during COVID, COVID shut it down, and then they just never talked about it again. If we don't get the collected, that's going to be an absolute crime for slasher history. But even if the collection is the end of this character with the little bit, the little minute nugget of explanation that we get for the collector, which is just enough for me, this is one of my favorite horror villains of all time. Oh, now we have the little bastards of the corn, and these fuckers are going right into rejects. I said wrong turn was the worst movie franchise that I have reviewed. But the worst movie franchise that I have watched is absolutely Children of the Corn. I, after watching the Children of the Corn reboot that came out earlier this year, told everybody that I was going to put myself through the pain of watching the rest of these movies that I had heard nothing but terrible things about and do a ranking of all of them. And that was like four months ago. And I still have not found the energy and the strength to finish that franchise to get that ranking video out. And when I do, I don't know what the hell I'm going to say about most of them because there is nothing to discuss about the vast majority of this franchise. It's just, let's put some creepy kids in a Nebraska cornfield and talk about the same shit over and over and over and over again. The first film, which easily for me, is one of the best, if not the best for most people of this franchise, is still not a very good movie. <laughs> not a very good movie whatsoever. The 80s nostalgia, it doesn't help that movie whatsoever. It's still pretty dull. But you have the character of Malachi, you have the character of uh, was it Isaac in the first film. Those two are somewhat iconic. Every other version of these characters, every other children of the corn, child of the corn, bastard of the corn, nothing memorable about them whatsoever. So because it's one of the most bafflingly overdone and creatively devoid franchises that I have ever had the displeasure of sitting through, if I had a tier below rejects, I would happily put them there. But we'll let them co-mingle with Annabelle and the hillbillies for now. Oh, now we have the fisherman and the fisherman for me, eh, uh, I'm going to put it in reject. It's nowhere near as bad as the two preceding him. But the fisherman to me has always been pretty lame. Like I like, I know what you did last summer. I even get some guilty pleasure enjoyment out of, I still know what you did last summer, but they are nowhere near as good as some of the other slasher films that we got in the 90s. It was only because they were following kind of the trend of Scream, hot young cast, masked villain, all that kind of stuff that they kind of got a little bit more of a boost. If those movies came out today, people would be like, that's generic and forgettable. And it kind of baffles me that we're actually getting a modern like legacy sequel here with Freddie Prinze Jr. and um, Jennifer Love Hewitt. Uh, that, that That's crazy to me. But uh, nonetheless... The Fisherman as an icon, as a villain, as the face of evil, pretty generic, pretty lame, not really intimidating, a very, very basic, simplistic look, which sometimes can work in their favor. For here, it's just kind of dull. And then when you include I'll Always Know What You Did Last Summer and what they attempt to do with this character as being like this evil spirit reincarnated zombie thing, that's enough to be like, okay, guys, <laughs> any bit of forgiveness I was going to give you, you just squandered, so... Down in the reject bin, you go. And finally, we will end with a bit of a heartbreak for me. My beloved Tiffany. The counterpoint for Chucky. And I'm going to stick Tiffany in memorable enough. And it sucks to do that because there are certain aspects to this character, predominantly in Bride of Chucky, that I adore. That I adore 
And even in Seed of Chucky, which is a movie that I despise, I still like Tiffany as a character in that movie for the most part. They still nail continuing on some of the aspects from Bride in a natural way. However, ever since Seed of Chucky, the way that they have utilized this character and the way that they have utilized Jennifer Tilly, I have not liked whatsoever. She more or less is relegated to a quick cameo in Cult of Chucky, in, or excuse me, Curse of Chucky. In Cult of Chucky, she gets a little bit more of a role, but is absolutely turned up campy. And from then on, they just continue to crank up the campiness to where in the first two seasons of the show, even more so in season two, they relegate Tiffany and Jennifer Tilly to just being the camp side of the show to where everything is somewhat serious in the show. And then they go to her and it's cartoonish. It is not serious even for a second. And it sucks because like I adore this character, both the doll and the human form. I adore Jennifer Tilly. And I just have not enjoyed what they have done with this character since Bride of Chucky. If Bride of Chucky was it, she would be up an iconic right next to Chucky, as she should be, because I love her in that movie. I think she actually steals the show from Chucky, and I don't even mind it in Bride of Chucky. But ever since Seed, Jennifer Tilly and Tiffany is one of the weaker elements of the, the execution of the Chucky franchise for me. Just It's just not what... I like what I appreciate, what I adore about the character that is continuing to be explored and fleshed out as it goes on. So, uh, knife to the heart to put her there in the middle, but I got to be honest, that's where she lands for me. All right, guys. Well, there it is. There is the completed tier list of the horror villain icons. Please, as I said before, let me know your tier by clicking the link down below, making yours. Tag me on social media or in your video when you do your own so that I can see the differences. And as always, guys, thank you for watching and give me some ideas down below for some other tier lists that you might want to check out. Well, that's it for this one, everybody. If you enjoyed that, please click over here for all of my 2023 new release reviews so far. And I'm also going to put my playlist of other tier lists that I have done for you to enjoy. Check out HelloFresh down in the video description below. Like, share, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss anything in the future. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.